So I, 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 my task for this afternoon is to post the second problem set. Uh, I'll, so I'll do it before this afternoon. Uh, I will not assign Ryan this, this go round. Just, just play with it on your own. Uh, what else? Anything else? Any, any other class logistical type issues? Should you pay attention? OK. Where I left off last time, uh, before the start of the weekend, was with seesaws talking about rotational motion. And so see, finally, you know, to give you a, be a better preview of where we're going with this, where, what we were headed with a seesaw is that this motion, this back and forth rocking motion of a seesaw is a, is a rotational motion. And it's not a steady rotational motion because this is a steady one. It, it involves rotation first one way, then another. So evidently, there is a, there is a change in, in the rotational equivalent of velocity, what's known as angular velocity. Angular velocity is changing with time as you rock. And that's known as angular acceleration. So I, I've been trying to flesh out the words the physical quantities associated with rotation so that we can look at things like two kids sitting on the, on the seesaw. I, I'm not going to do it on that because I'll end up with them on the floor. But, but these two kids, if they sit at the proper distance from the pivot, they can balance the seesaw. I'm almost there. There we are. And then they can rock back and forth relatively easily. And to try to explain why this all works, I had to sort of build up the story of rotational motion. That's, that's kind of where I am at this point. And I'll remind you, you know, more specifically where I am. I talked about angular position being the measure of an object's orientation relative to some reference. It's kind of a boring uh, topic, except it does introduce the idea that, that angular position, like many of the other quantities of rotation, is a vector. It has a direction to it. And the direction is not intuitive. It's weird, OK? It's the rotisserie uh, axis. It's, by, by, it's a convention. The convention is that it's the rotisserie axis around which the displacement from the zero position, zero angular position, to, the, to the, the one you're paying attention to, it's the axis you rotate about to go there. And it's the amount of the rotation, as in this is less than this, and this is more still. And finally, the rotisserie axis isn't quite enough information because this rotation is otherwise very similar to this rotation. To distinguish the two, people invented this right-hand rule and defined, so it's a the conventional definition, that this rotation, like this, using your right hand to, to the fingers of your right hand to sort of identify the, the direction in which you're turning, allows your thumb to point along the, rota the, the official direction of that angular position, up. And this is up. This is down. But up and down are just two possible choices. I can show you uh, this is toward you. This is away from you. And you know, all the other possibilities. Is that OK with people at this point? All right. So angular position was how you're oriented, basically, and a, and a formal way of doing it. And one of the values of, of having these formal definitions is because you can, in principle, call someone up on the telephone and tell them how someone's oriented using this kind of language. The one thing that has to happen is they have to know what's their right hand. If they don't know what their, what's their right hand, they can't distinguish this from this because uh, they need that artifact. It's an interesting story about our, you know, our universe has a symmetry to it, a mirror symmetry, that, that, that things in the mirror look an awful lot like things not in the mirror. Where does that matter? It means that without seeing a right hand or seeing a shoe, there's no way in which you can tell someone off in some distant planet which is their right hand, which is their left hand. There's no, nothing they can do to, to prove one is their right and one is their left. They need an artifact, an object to, as reference to, with which to work. It, if, if that makes no sense or, or, or solves nothing you care about, uh, I apologize. But it's just an interesting observation. But otherwise, you can tell someone how you're rotated. OK, the rate at which your angular position is changing with time, which, it is, which mine is doing at the moment, is angular velocity. And it, too also, it also has a direction 
according to the same recipe. In, in this case, my rotation is upward. And I will change it, and now my rotation is downward. So this is quite a different angular velocity than I had a moment ago. It's completely reversed, pointing the opposite direction. And I'll stop. All right? Yeah. The, the, direction, the direction in which your thumb is pointing is the direction of the physical quantity you have in mind. So if it's, if it's, if it's angular position, the direction of my thumb right now is the direction of my angular position with, given that this was the zero. This is official zero. So, so I'm rotated 90 degrees, if you like, or a quarter of a turn up. Is that OK with everybody? If, it's, if, if, the, if the quantity we had in mind was angular velocity, this, my thumb is pointing now in the direction of my angular velocity. I am rotating at uh, about, about one turn every two seconds up. And now I'm rotating at one turn every two seconds down. You can do it in degrees. It could be uh, 180 degrees per second. Is that OK? So <coughs> that leaves us then with, well, the, the observation that things left to themselves basically rotate at constant angular velocity. But there, was a, there were some caveats in that. They, they were not allowed to wobble or change shape. Things, so otherwise, uh, it, it's very similar to the world of, of translational motion. All right. Uh, what if an object like this is not left to itself? What if it experiences the influences that cause changes in angular velocity? And those influences are known as torques. And if some object like this experiences an overall torque, again, it, it doesn't respond to the individual torques. It responds to their grand sum where you take into account the directions of the torques, their net torque, then, it undergoes angular acceleration. So if I give this thing, exert a torque on it, which is to say if I twist it, it undergoes angular acceleration. So, so right now, it, it's got, a, I'll, I'll get it where it's got almost zero angular velocity, almost, almost zero. And now I'll give it a, a twist. Whoosh. While I was twisting, I was causing angular acceleration. That is a change in its, ang in its angular velocity. And I, I use the word angular or rotational accidentally. I, go, I, I shift. The official name is angular velocity, angular acceleration. But who cares? It's naming. But you can see torques cause angular acceleration. Is that OK? And not surprisingly, there is a resistance to angular acceleration. That is the measure of an object's rotational inertia, how hard it is to get it get its attention when you twist it. And I told you the official name last time. It's called moment of inertia. But, but my, my preferred name, and it's perfectly valid, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very useful name for it, much more useful name, just rotational mass. Just call it rotational mass. There are reasons why it's got the fancy name. It has a complexity to it that's a nuisance. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sweeping mostly under the rug. But rotational mass is good enough. And you can imagine different objects have different rotational masses. That is, different re resistances to, to, uh, to anger acceleration. And how would you determine an object's resistance to anger acceleration? Well, try, try rotating it back and forth, the rotational version of shaking. So if I try to twist it back and forth, ah, this one's pretty hard to twist back and forth. It's got a pretty large rotational mass. In contrast, this. Uh, yeah, that's not bad. Get back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I realized one demonstration I, I, I didn't bring out here that I'll maybe go, go nab. So, so different objects have different resistances to anger, anger acceleration. And finally, there's a Newton's second law for rotation. That's, that's what's been up here since the start, that, that if you exert a certain net torque on an object and it has a certain rotational mass to resist that torque, the object will undergo anger acceleration. It's simply the, the, uh, the torque exerted on it divided by its rotational mass. And it's a quantitative exact uh, relationship. So the more torque you exert on something overall, the, the greater its anger acceleration. On the other hand, the, the more rotational mass it has, the less it undergoes anger acceleration. Is that OK? OK, so where does this fit in? I want to go grab that demonstration. Yes, back in a second. So, 
since this is the first time in the semester I've done this, you can see that I can talk to you while I'm going. The moment of inertia. All right, I'm coming back. You better be good. All right. So, so the point of this is, is, is what? These two bars actually have the same mass. They contain, the, if, you add, if you count up the atoms in this material, they're all the same. They're the same. But it's distributed differently. And so the point of this is, although they have the same mass, and it turns out that rotational mass, like all of the quantities of rotation, are related to the, to the translational quantities. Rotational mass and ordinary mass are related to each other. You, in effect, you create rotational mass by strategically placing ordinary mass at various distances from the pivot about which the rotation occurs. And it turns out the more, the farther you put the mass, ordinary inertial stuff, from the pivot, the more it affects rotation. The harder it is to make that, that object undergo angular acceleration. So I need two, two uh, helpers here. Come on up. One other, one other person? OK. So, so the first thing to do is, is to, to, to notice that these have the same mass, which, to which you do is you can weigh them. You can hold them in your hand and feel how heavy they are. They're, they're pretty much indistinguishable, right? Is that fair? OK. Patty, and your name is? Sydney. OK. So, so I'm going to give one of these bars to, to each of you. And, when I tell, and you hold it in the middle, which will be the pivot. And when I tell you to, 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 to start, I want you to basically measure their rotational mass by, by rotationally shaking them, twist them back and forth as fast as you can. OK? Ready? Get set? Go. Now, Sydney seems to be going much slower than Patty over here. Hmm. Is, and now, now you get to trade, OK? <laughs> so this is one of these demonstrations that you have to try it yourself so you can sneak up. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you guys so so t try it yourself to, see, to feel the difference. Because you can see them doing it. Obviously, there's a difference. This is the one Patty had in her hand at the end. Uh, uh, where's the mass located on this one, do you think? At the ends. So there's almost nothing hiding inside the pipe where I'm gripping it. Where's all the mass in this one, the one that's easy? It's in my hand. It's easy to go back and forth. So what's the, the point of this, other than it's, it's, it's fun, is, is that, first off, that, that rotational mass comes out of ordinary mass. But where the placement is, where the mass is placed makes a big difference. The farther it is from, from the center, from the pivot, the more it contributes to rotational mass. And that has consequences for a seesaw in the, the following context. The two, two kids sitting all the way out at the ends introduce a lot of mass to that seesaw. At a great distance from the pivot, they, they create a large rotational mass. They make the seesaw hard to undergo angular acceleration. You can follow that idea? If they, so, so, so rocking this back and forth is kind of a slow process, takes some effort. If they both are really good friends, they sit right there. This is easy. Almost no rotational mass. So if, if you want to win the speed seesawing contest with your friend, go and sit like right next to the pivot and go back and forth. OK? Important uh, tips for future success in life. OK. Uh, a little bit about, I mean, OK. I'm going to ask this question in a second. The, co the context, the reason for asking this question is because the, I've talked about rotation, all this rotational stuff, and torques is just like you twist it. But where does the torque come from, kind of? Is it unrelated to a force? And it turns out it's not unrelated to a force. And so this, this brings us to the, to the issue. Uh, so to make mini-me, well, who's mini-me? Mini-me, here's mini-me. <laughs> uh, 
It's, 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 mini Me's getting really old here. Mini, mini Me, I made it for a television show 15 years ago uh, on, on, the, on the science of football. And uh, he's still hanging in there, but it was all about, about where you tackle makes a difference. Tackle low versus tackle high. Anyhow, the question at hand is related to tackling. If you take Mini Me here, and I want to make Mini Me undergo clockwise angular acceleration. Clockwise is another convention that you all know about for rotations. That if you're viewing something, you can distinguish a rotation like this from a rotation like this because of your familiarity with clocks. Uh, although as the digital generation continues, you may lose track of what the heck is clockwise. I hope not. Anyway, this is clockwise, right? It's actually the same as away from you in the other convention. You see how they're just two, they're just two conventions. And, and, and either one's good if you just want to answer a question. So, so here's the question. How do we make mini-me here undergo clockwise angular acceleration? Where do I smack him? You, got, you OK with the question? So uh, the top of his head toward his feet. A? OK. No. Nobody wants that. B, the side of his head toward your right. Ooh, everybody's going for that one. C, the middle of his body toward your right. Or D, the side of his feet toward your right. OK, a, a, a few. Let's try side of your feet toward your right. No, it causes counterclockwise angular acceleration. OK? <laughs> so take that, right? <laughs> Well, he lost some of his weight. <laughs> to be fixed later. At least he didn't lose his head. It's still there. How about that? Plywood's tough stuff. OK, so what's the point of all of this? <laughs> it is possible to, to, I caused angular acceleration, right? You could see it was angular acceleration. He went from, from motionless vertical, that is a, 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 a anger velocity of 0, to whoosh, suddenly an anger velocity that is, could be described either as away from us, according to one convention, or clockwise in another convention. And so I evidently exerted a torque on Mini-Me. But I did it with an impact force. I smacked him with a force. So forces and torques are evidently related. And how so? Well, it turns out that you can produce a torque. And I, I struggle with the language, produce, exert, something a torque on an object with a force, but you need a little bit of strategic placement and, and, and otherwise range, ranging it. And my favorite example for, for how to do this isn't mini-me, it's with a door. When you go up to a conventional door and you want to open the door by grabbing the doorknob, the door's opening motion is a rotation about its hinges, right? Oh, no! Close it. OK. So, so when, you're, when you're doing this, you're exerting a force on the doorknob, and yet it is undergoing angular acceleration. Which way do you push? Like, how, you know, where on the door do you push, and in which direction? It matters. Well, you've all had the experience of pushing right on the hinge side of the door, right? You look at the door, you can't tell. It doesn't have a doorknob. You can't tell which is the opening side. You push on the wrong side. Nothing happens. So evidently, a force exerted at the pivot does nothing for you. And that was the reason why Mini-Me had as one of the choices hitting in the middle, right? Mid the middle of the body towards your right. If you hit Mini-Me, he's now a little unbalanced, like me. You know, that doesn't do anything good, right? For him. So, so forces exerted at the pivot or toward the pivot don't do anything in terms of, of twisting. So, so you, yeah. all the blood is rushing to his head. It's really grim. Um, so, so to open a door, you don't push. You neither push on its hinges, nor do you push its doorknob toward the hinges. All of those motions produce no torque. To produce a torque on a door, you first off you have to go away from the hinges, and and that change in, in position, which is both a distance and a direction, it's a vector, is called the lever arm. So this is, we're, going, we're going briefly into the world of levers, which you've sur surely encountered somewhere in, in your past educational experiences. 
You go away from the pivot, and in the act of doing that, you create this thing called a lever arm. And you push, not along the lever arm toward the hinges, nor away from the hinges. Stay away from the line that is that lever arm. Push at right angles to it. So you grab the doorknob over here on the door. So now this door opens this way. That was important, of course. And I'm going to lever arm away from the hinges, and I'm going to push it toward you, and it opens. How so? Because I was, here's the lever arm, and I was pushing at right angles to that lever arm. That produces a torque. And it turns out the torque that you exert in this manner is equal to the force you exert times the lever arm, where you take into account uh, the direction so that, that the maximum occurs at right angles and it goes to zero at, at zero angles. It, it, it involves trigonometry. It's not a big deal, but it's not worth great uh, attention. So, so that now explains why when you alone get on a seesaw and sit on it, you cause angular acceleration. You exerted a downward force very closely related to your weight on that bar at a lever arm from the pivot. You produce a torque. And down it went. Is that OK? There's a, finally the issue of which direction is the torque. And there is another right hand rule for which direction it is. If you, if you go, what is this, along the lever arm, yes. You don't have to remember it. I'll show it to you. Who cares? You can figure it out. That, that if you go along the lever arm, which in this case is this, with your, with your index finger, and then you bend, either whip your index finger in the direction of the force, or you use your, your middle finger to point in the direction of the force, and your thumb points in the direction of the torque you are exerting with it. The point is, finally, that when you sit on the right side of the seesaw, and push down on it with, with a force related to your weight, it undergoes angular acceleration away from you. Questions about that idea? How about if a second kid comes over and sits at the other side? There. Well, the other kid, the other kid pushes down on the seesaw at a lever arm from the pivot that's different lever arm, other direction. And now whoosh, their torque is toward you. So we've got two children. This isn't you anymore, right? You're not a child. So, so this child is producing a torque away from you. This child is producing a torque toward you. It happens to be equal. That's why I was, I was, I was moving this, this kid around to find just the right lever arm to allow that child to produce a torque that cancels the other child's torque. And that's the point. The seesaw, when you balance the seesaw, that is, you, you render it free of torques. You do that free of net torque. You do that by putting two children at opposite sides of the pivot, where they will produce torques in opposite directions. And you adjust their distance from the pivot so that their torques are equal in amount. But they are opposite in direction. They sum to zero. And, it, and suddenly, the seesaw is free of torque. And, and undergoes the motion of, a, of an inertial object. It, it, it coasts rotationally. OK? Any, any questions on this, this, this business? So really, I, I, I can just finish the seesaw story with the observation that the seesaw doesn't turn steadily because that's boring. That what the kids do is they, is they touch their feet. They either touch their feet to the ground as when, they, when they reach the ground, or they lean back and forth and adjust their lever arms a little. But what they, what they do in, in playing on a seesaw is unbalance it periodically. So whenever they're, they get to the end of a partial rotation, when, they, when there's nothing, no, they can't go any further and they're ready to go the other way, they unbalance it, either by touching the ground and getting another force, and therefore another torque, to join the party, or by leaning in and out to change their lever arms so that, again, they're unbalanced. And they undergo angular acceleration, and they rock back the other way. All right? All right, that, uh, do I have it as a question?
I do, but it, but it talks about a student doing it. I'm going to do it. So here's what I'm going to do. Well, I'll, I'll show you the question. It's in here. I used to do this with an egg. I won't do it with an egg anymore because it's just too messy. And I got egg on the screen one time, and that you don't want to get egg on a projector screen. It never, ever, 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 ever comes off. There's a water balloon on a little seesaw. And the seesaw is now obviously water balloon low because it exerts a torque on the seesaw by itself um, that is toward you. And that one dominated the motion of the seesaw until the table itself began to exert a torque in the opposite direction. And everybody now is stable. But when I wallop this side of the seesaw, it's going to undergo very rapid angular acceleration because I'm going to exert a completely dominant torque on it in the direction away from you. So the question, for no particularly good reason, is where is the balloon going to burst? On the launch pad, in midair, or on landing? And I, you, you can keep your vote secret. It turns out I can't predict which of the first and last it will do. Uh, it has done some of each over the years. It has never, however, burst in midair, because there are no forces in midair. Nothing's going to push on it and, and break it. But during launch, that balloon's going to experience a horrendous upward force. And it could easily and has often burst. If it doesn't, it goes in the air, and it bursts on impact. All right? Ready? Get set. <laughs> <laughs> A won this, this, this go round. Ah. All right. It used to be an egg. <laughs> Not, that wouldn't be so funny if it were an egg. Okay. Wheels. So, so having gone through rotational motion, um, wheels, to an extent, are, are, are also the story of rotational motion. But more, they're the story of friction. And I, I've talked up until now about, yeah, look, no, I got it on the screen, too. So like, this is good it was water. It is, you know, water is such an amazing material. We'll, we'll deal with it later in the semester as, as water, steam, and ice. And it has features about it that, are, that make it unique among, among the uh, chemical compounds in, in nature. Uh, it, it's really, yeah, I could, I, could, I could give and do, I guess, a lecture on water. Uh, I could probably teach a course on water. Anyhow, I'm glad I've got water on me, as opposed to anything else. In this. So, so, OK, wheels. It's a story of friction, in, in large part. And, and which, to put it in perspective, I've introduced Two forces so far, gravity, which was the, the, behind the whole idea of falling, falling objects, it's gravity is the story. For the ramp stuff, I, I introduced support forces. Support forces are exerted perpendicular to the surfaces that are touching. They push each other apart. Friction is a third force. It's a different force. It looks superficially like it's support force related, because it involves two surfaces touching. But the forces of friction are along those surfaces, not perpendicular to them. So, that, so together, support force and friction force, they make a complete story. A any force between two surfaces can be described as, as, in, in, as in part support and in part friction. Although you know, it, can be one, it, can, it, can be, it can be entirely one or the other, but it's, it's often somewhere in between, some combination. OK. So to start this off, will your car accelerate faster if you skid the wheels? You, you know that if, you, if you've got a, a muscle car and you stomp on the accelerator while you're, when the light turns green, you can make the wheel spin. And, you know, it smells, and it shoots smoke out, and it's really fun and exciting. Um, it wears your wheels out. Will that make you accelerate forward faster than just you know, hitting the accelerator just hard enough so the wheels don't quite begin to, to, to skid. 
You okay with the question? How many think, A, that you will, you'll accelerate fastest if you do skid the wheels? How many think, B, you'll accelerate fastest if you don't quite skid the wheels? It, it turns out B is the correct answer. Uh, once you skid the wheels, in part you, you, you start to lose control of direction, but, but also the grip effect that those wheels have on the ground for normal tires is slightly weaker than it would have if it actually uh, engaged with the ground and did not slide along. There are tires that are used like in drag racing and stuff like that that melt. You can get them to melt and they act, they're, they're more like driving on, on adhesive pads. They're, they're, they're literally gripping the road and that's a, those are weird cases. But, the, but normally you don't want to skid the wheels in part because you get better grip and better uh, acceleration if you don't and in part because you wear your wheels out. And that's, those are both issues we've got to deal with. So some observations about wheels is first off, friction makes a wheelless cart uh, not very fun. Here is my sad wagon. I, I, I'm still feeling sorry for this guy. His wheels are still downstairs, but, but, but he's been disabled since birth. And, and it, it, he just can't keep going the way his, his sibling can. So, wheels. So, and the, and the cause of this problem is friction. So friction can, can keep objects, uh, can slow objects to a stop. More about that in a minute. It can waste energy. It can cause wear. Uh, it, it's typically a problem for, for transportation. And so how do you solve these problems? Wheels. For the, for the vehicles that want to go somewhere, you put wheels on them. Uh, remarkable device, you know, super simple. We all take it for granted. Nobody wants to reinvent it anymore. It's been around since who knows. But it allows you to move, I should say, not without friction, as we'll see, but rather without wasting energy by way of friction. So we'll get there. OK, bunch of questions. First, the first one is the one we'll start with, of course, is, is why does a wagon need wheels at all? And it's not hard to answer that. Let me get rid of some of the odds and ends. So without wheels, friction dominates the motion of something like a wagon or a car. If I get it started moving to the right, it doesn't retain that motion. So I've told you from the start of the class that inertia me means that because of inertia, an object that's in motion should continue in motion. And yet this one doesn't. At the start of my story, it's moving to the right. At the end of the story, it stopped. What happened? Inertia failed. And even worse, if I go to the, the other direction, it still fails. There's, there's a, like a directional fix to the, to the problem. It, 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 or no matter which way I try to make that poor guy go, it slows to a stop. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why inertia is not obvious to many people. Well, it wasn't obvious to the people who sort of developed science in general for thousands of years. It took, it took really great insights on the part of people like Galileo and Newton to figure out that inertia really is there and that objects left in themselves really do continue to keep move. And that's, uh, it was, inertia was masked in large part by friction. So. Some, some observations about friction. First off, it opposes relative motion between two surfaces. So in this case, the two surfaces involved are the top of the table and the bottom of the wagon. And what friction is doing is it's acting to bring those two surfaces to the same velocity. At the start of the story, they don't have the same velocity. At the end, they do. At the start of the story, the wagon had a velocity to the right of, I don't know, one meter per second. The, the table on the other hand had a velocity of zero. They began to interact with each other by way of friction, and when the dust settled, they were both traveling at zero, uh, uh, a velocity of zero. What happened? Well, the table pushed the wagon to the right, to the left, and the wagon pushed the table to the right, and the table being attached to the earth barely accelerated at all in response to that little force. But the wagon, being a little thing of its, of, on its own with a modest mass, underwent acceleration. And it lost its rightward velocity, slowed 
uh, gradually down and came to a stop. Is that okay? If I did this, you know, never plan ahead adequately. If I did this on a, on a, a surface that could move, like one of those uh, big flat carts, then we could see that actually they, they are negotiating for, for who, you know, who, whose velocity do we settle at, and they will end up with some velocity in between. The fact that I use a table, which is just never going to move very much, means that you, you don't get to see the, the real tr them trying to agree on a, on a shared velocity. But if, you put, if I did the same activity on a moving car top, we're driving by and I, and I threw the, the cart onto the top of a hard top car, it would slow to a stop, and the, the shared velocity that they would have, the common velocity, would be one that's not zero. It would, be, you know, it would head off out the, wind, out the no window. All right? So that's the first thing about, about uh, friction, then, is it, it tries to bring objects that are sliding across one another to the same velocity. Uh, it acts parallel to the surfaces. I already told you about that. And as with every force, it comes in Newton's third law pairs. So when the box pushed on the table, the table pushed on the box, or the wagon. Equal forces in opposite directions. One affected the wagon, one affected the table. The one that affected the table did very little uh, visible. The one that affected the wagon brought the wagon to a stop. OK? So why is getting the wagon, or the box, started to move on the table the hardest, uh, harder typically than keeping it moving. So let me show you that effect. And to do this, I gotta put some kids in the wagon. So they all pile in. Don't scratch the wagon, guys. All right. And I'm gonna use a spring scale that will show you how hard I'm pulling. And if things work out properly, you'll see, I'll tell you what you're gonna see. Uh, and it, you'll see that I will begin to pull harder and harder. I'm already doing it a little bit just to get, get started here. I'm pulling on it, and yet nothing is happening. So what that means is that initially, frictional forces are developing between, those, between the, the wagon and the table such that, the, the, that no relative motion between them begins to appear. They're, they're, they are at the same velocity and stay in that way. They're fighting me. The friction's fighting me. Eventually, I'll overcome that, that, that grip, and the, the wagon will start to slide. And what I want you to notice is that the force that I exert on the wagon with the help of the scale will start at zero, get stronger and stronger and stronger to the right, and then the wagon will begin to slide. And in all likelihood, the force that I'll need to keep the wagon sliding will be a little smaller than the force that finally got it to slide. Questions about, the, about what I've just described? You know, hopefully you can just see it. We'll, I'll pull. I'm, I'm exerting two newtons of force to the right, and nothing's happening. Four newtons to the right, nothing's happening. Six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Six, oh, I got to 16, and suddenly we got movement. Not only that, but it's easy. You, you saw the effect? Well, what, what was going on there is that they're really, in this Context, there are two different sorts of frictions. And actually, it's, it's two, there are actually more than two, but the two are the main ones. There is the force of friction that opposes the start of relative motion. When the two objects are, are at the same velocity, gripping each other, and have been doing it for a little while, that's called static friction. So the force of static friction is, is present when two surfaces are trying to slide across one another, but they haven't started yet. And then, if, if, if sliding does occur, and they are moving relative to one another, a different type of friction shows up known as, I call it sliding friction. It's, it is sometimes called dynamic friction. It doesn't, you know, the name doesn't matter, but it's, it, when the relative motion's there, I'll call it sliding. And what you could see in, in what I just showed you, I hope I, I, hope I can repeat it. It's, a, it, 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 it's in the real world, that there, it's not always controllable. The force of static friction is adjustable, first off, because right now the table is exerting a static frictional force to the left on the wagon. 
just enough to counteract or cancel my force to the right. And it's adjustable. If I pull four to the right, it pulls four to the left. If I pull six to the right, it pulls six to the left. Eight to the right, eight to the left. It's, 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 it's fighting me. But if I go up towards, I don't know, what was it? It was about 16, I, I, things broke free. Ah, yeah, at 16, the wagon breaks free. Static friction, in this, in this particular case, can't, the table cannot exert more than 16 newtons of static frictional force on the wagon toward the left. It can't do it. And something, something gives. And once that happens, and the wagon begins to slide, there's a dramatic drop in the force of friction that the table exerts on the wagon. It's no longer static friction, because sliding is taking place. And that force dropped about 8 newtons. In fact, it's, it's pretty steady at 8 newtons, in all likelihood. It uh, usually doesn't depend on much of anything in terms of, there you go, eight, 8 newtons. And no matter how fast I go, it's about 8 newtons. So the force of sliding friction uh, is pretty much a fixed value. It's, it's not adjustable. It's just a certain amount. Uh, it, de it depends on the surfaces. If, it, if I had sandpaper between them, it would be, 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 <laughs> would be bigger. And, and the way I like to think about the difference between static friction and sliding friction is, suppose you have two hairbrushes, and you, you put their, their teeth into each other, their, their, their pins into each other. And if you let them sort of settle into each other, and you try to slide them, try to get them started sliding, it's hard. They're kind of locked in. But once you get them started, and they're just the, the, the pins are sort of bouncing off each other, and they kind of get separated, then they slide more easily. OK? And friction really does involve very complicated, detailed uh, interactions of the tiny parts of the top of the table, in this case, and the bottom of the wagon. The, bottom, to the top of the table and the bottom of the wagon are not touching everywhere. They're touching at various little contact points. And it, it's the interactions of those contact points that give rise to, to friction. And the more, actually, uh, the harder you push the two surfaces together, the more contact points there are uh, showing up, acting to support the wagon. So the forces of friction typically scale with the, the pressure, the, the force pushing the surfaces together. And you know this from experience that you know, if, if I take the kitties out of the wagon, and now there's much less force pushing the wagon against the table or the table against the wagon, now the forces of friction are all tiny. I can't even show them to you anymore. They're, they're, they're so small, they're not noticeable on that scale. So if you want to increase the frictional forces between, say, the rear wheel of your rear wheel drive truck and the ground on a, on a day when the weather's bad and stuff like that, you pile all kinds of cement blocks and your friends and the keg on top of the wheel so that the, the weight of that stuff squishes the wheel hard against the, the pavement, and it gets better grip, more friction. Is that OK? Uh, I should say modern cars, most of them are, are front wheel drive, not rear wheel drive. When I grew up, they were you know, rear, rear, rear wheel drive was, was standard. Uh, and that meant that the kids sitting in the back, one of them had, in the middle, had this big bump in the car where the drive shaft and the engine in the front went by and you had to, we fought over who didn't get the bump. I don't want to sit over it today. OK. So rear, rear wheel drive. Front wheel drive cars now, if they're not oh, four wheel, front wheel, they have sitting over that, those front wheels. What's sitting over that, those, that front wheels that's very heavy? The engine. Great idea. So they got this huge weight sitting on those wheels, helping them grip the road. OK? What else do I want to say about all this stuff? With five minutes to go. Ah, OK. This is good. OK, I, I, I got enough time to do, to do my fun and games. Where does the energy go? And, and, and I, I'm just going to give short shrift to the, the energy problem. When this box was moving, wagon was moving, it had energy, energy in its motion. Where did that energy come from? It came from me. I gave the wagon a push to the right, and it moved to the right. I did work on it. it. It comes out moving with energy, and then it slows to a stop, and the energy's gone. So you see that I did work. I gave energy to the wagon. The wagon had energy in its movement, 
and then it had less energy in its movement, and then less energy, and then it was stopped. Where did the energy go? You, 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 got, you okay with the question, the, the issue? The energy disappeared. It didn't disappear, it ended up ground up into little itty bitty pieces and sprinkled uh, among the atoms and molecules that are the top of the table and that are the bottom of the wagon. They rubbed against each other and got hot. And you can do this yourself. I'm sure you've done this, right? Rub your hands together and you feel you're doing physical work, moving your hands back and forth. Friction is doing work, in, in, I should be careful. Friction is, is consuming that energy and turning it into thermal energy, making your fingers and hot, uh, hands hot. And that energy that go, that's, that's then present in what, what I call thermal energy, it's conventional energy. It's the energy of motion, and it's the energy of, with stored in forces, but it's a, among the little pieces that make up a material, all the little atoms and molecules jittering around. And so a first demonstration with respect to that is this one. I'm going to turn work from me into thermal energy in the old you know, fire starter. Uh, this is always a little bit problematic, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to spin a pin, a wooden pin, between two pieces of wood, and if, I, if I'm lucky more than anything else, I'll get, I'll get it to smoke. Can you see the smoke? I can see the smoke. Smoking. Yeah. All right. So, so you can get things hot enough to, to catch fire with, with sliding friction. Uh, it turns out it's only sliding friction does this. Static friction, there's no relative movement, so there's no work being done. The distance is missing. But in sliding friction, there's the distance. And you can, you can end up with, with converting mechanical work into thermal energy. So just to, where, where I finish with this, this little story is, is some various forms of energy. We've seen that there's energy associated with movement. It's called kinetic energy. So an object that's moving, has, all else being equal, has more energy in it than an object that's stationary. We've also seen gravitational potential energy, an object that's high has more energy in it, all else being equal, than an object that's low. The energy is stored in the force of gravity. Magnets can store energy. Um, elastic things can store energy. Right? I, I did work. I shoved air in and it moved in. I did work. It's in this balloon now, and it's stored in the, in the forces between the elastic components of the membrane. And off it goes. It can do things now. Uh, more, more fun. Do you ever have one of these? You know, Uncle Jim, do you want some mixed nuts? <laughs> oh, sure, I'd love some. <laughs> ah! Right? And then the kid shoves, shoves the snake back in and goes back up to Uncle Jim. Do you want some more mixed nuts? Oh, sure. Okay, you get the idea. Okay, uh, I, where to leave this with? Uh, there are all kinds of stored forms of energy. Uh, I've got lists up there. The one I, I, I want to finish with, because it's always fun, is electrostatic uh, potential energy. So it's energy stored in the forces between electric charges, a topic we will not deal with th this semester. We won't deal with electric charges. It's, you know, enough is enough. But I can pull apart huge numbers of opposite charges, positives and negatives. And if you remember the old expression, opposites attract, the act of separating positive and negative charges requires work. And if you let them get back together again, they will release a lot of energy. And so plus, plus is plus to plus, minus to minus. I cannot pull them apart with my hands, but I can use a battery to do it. So, the so these 10 batteries, what used to be called transistor batteries, or 9-volt batteries, are now delicately pulling apart positive and negative charges, putting positive charges on one surface, negative charges on another. You can't see the surfaces, but they're in here. So there's a huge storage of positives in one place and negatives in the other. And I am going to allow them to get together with the help of a screwdriver. So I'm going to go touch one, one surface, and I'm going to teeter over and allow them to rush through the screwdriver from one side to the other and get together and be very happy. Ready, set. So that's why it's fun. All right. <laughs>